The gospel of John is sometimes called the simple gospel. I don't think so. It is true that the simplicity of the language has caused a great many to stumble and call this the simple gospel. The fact of the matter is that there are many monosyllabic and disyllabic words that are in this gospel. If you just turn anywhere in the gospel, you find out that most of the words are just one-syllable words. And it's unusual to find one that has three syllables in it. And because of that, why, a great many say, well, look, this is very simple. I won't have any difficulty of understanding it. Well, let me give to you one of the simplest statements that you can find anywhere, and it's found in John 14, 20. It says, "...and ye in me, and I in you." Have you ever noticed every word there is a little monosyllabic word? One syllable. Some of them have just two letters. Actually, only two of them have three letters in a word. And I think you could take any 60-year-old child and you would take any word and ask him the meaning of each word here, and he could tell you. But did you know when you put them all together and you read, "...and ye in me, and I in you," the most profound philosopher and the deepest theologian can never plumb the depths of the meaning of that statement. That's what I mean when I say, friends, we are coming to the most profound gospel of all, and I believe really the most difficult to understand. We get the surface meaning of it because we know the meaning of the words, but it doesn't mean that we know it by any means. And here is a gospel where we truly need the Lord Jesus to be our teacher. Now, let me say today some matters that are matters of introduction that ought to introduce us to this gospel. John the Apostle is the writer. He was the son of Zebedee and Salome, and he was the brother of James, and his authorship has been seriously questioned by the Tübingen School of Critics in Germany years ago, and this was taken up by a great many of the liberal school in this country because they have been more or less copycats of the German school. But the objections that were raised have been fully answered by conservative scholarship and the Johannine authorship today is received by competent and conservative Bible scholarship. So there's no question about that. I remember in seminary, and that's a long time ago, we had a young fellow in there that was quite a wag. He wasn't the greatest scholar that there ever was, but he did have an ability to get right to the nub of any matter. And we had a course in which we studied the Gospel of John to determine who was the writer. And we took up all the different suggestions that had been made, and then we took up the question whether John wrote it. And when all the evidence was in, we came to the conclusion that John wrote the gospel of John. And this fella, this wag in the class, he says, we just wasted a whole semester. He said, I believed and knew John wrote it when I began this course, and now I'm right back where it started. And you can waste a whole lot of time, friends, with the liberals. They will take you down the garden pathway, I can assure you, and raise many objections and many questions. But I think you can reasonably not assume but know that John the Apostle is the writer of this gospel. And the early church fathers all ascribed the fourth gospel to John. Theophilus was bishop of Antioch, about 180 A.D. Irenaeus lived about 190 A.D. He was a pupil of Polycarp, and Polycarp was a pupil of John himself. And then Clement of Alexandria over in Egypt, 200 A.D., 
And the Muratorian fragment says the fourth gospel is by John. I don't know about you. I get a little weary today listening to the liberal. He bores me, if you want to know my viewpoint. I had to go to school to so many of them and listen to their dry lectures that I wish there was some way I could get even with them because they certainly tortured me and for no purpose, actually. Now, the date of this gospel is rather important. Some suppose that it's the last book of the New Testament to be written. It was written somewhere, of course, between 90 and 100 A.D. I think that John wrote in that period the Gospel of John and the three epistles that bear his name, and also the book of Revelation. Now, I rather take the opinion that the epistles were written after the book of Revelation. That's just my own private judgment, by the way. And they were all written, though, during the last ten years of the life of the beloved apostle. Now, let me tell you some striking features about the structure of this gospel. You will recall that I said at the beginning that the gospel of Matthew was written to and for the Jew. The gospel of Mark was written to and for the Roman. And the gospel of Luke was written to and for the Greek. And for those who have that same type of mind today. And the gospel of John was written to meet the need of that great mass of folk in the East. They were the wretched folk, if you please. Many of them were rich, extremely rich. Many of them were woefully and horribly poor. They knew what poverty was. But they all were in great need, and there was a great hunger. For it was out of the east that there came wise men, asking the question, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east. We've come to worship him. And so we find that John meets the need of that type of mind. After all, the ancestors of most of us came out of that area. The fact of the matter is the ancestors of all of us did, because Ham, Shem, and Japheth all were in that area. And there was a great Hamitic kingdom in that area. That was the kingdom of Babylon, and that was a Hamitic kingdom. And then out of that area came the sons of Japheth. Abraham came from that area the son of Shem, so that out of that area came these people, and they've been a needy people, and that speaks of you and me today. And it may be that's the reason the gospel of John has been so universally received and studied, because of that. I have given this kind of a division. I worked on a newspaper when I was a student in college, and I've attempted to divide the Gospels, as you know, according to a newspaper. Because, after all, the Gospel is good news. Of course, newspapers generally have bad news in them, including the death notices. And Matthew gives the announcements and advertising. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Mark carries the flaming headlines. Behold, my servant. What a headline. And then we find that Luke has the special features. He alone records the songs connected with the birth of Christ and the stories of the good Samaritan and the prodigal son. But John has the editorial section. He's written on the bread of life, the water of life, the true vine, and the Christian life. His is quite interesting, and we'll see that in just a moment. The first three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels because they are written according to a similar pattern. But the fourth Gospel is different. Matthew and Mark emphasize the miracles of Jesus, and Luke gives attention to the parables. But John does neither. The miracles of Jesus are given as signs, and they were chosen with a great deal of discrimination. 
in order to interpret certain great truths. For instance, Jesus fed the 5,000, and then there follows his discourse on the bread of life. And there are 11 specific signs in the Gospel of John. Now, there are no parables in the fourth gospel, and we'll see that when we get into the gospel, because I know that there'll be those that say, well, in the tenth chapter, the sixth verse, why the word parable occurs about the good shepherd. But actually, the Greek word there is not parabole, but paroimia, which is an altogether different word, and it ought not to be translated by the word parable at all. Then we've talked to you about the simplicity of the language of this gospel, which, of course, is remarkable indeed. And then John does something else that's quite interesting. He gives a chronological order which is well to note. fact of the matter is, it's one that, if you follow along, it gives you a ladder on which you can fit the three-year ministry of Christ. For instance, you'll find him using right here in this first chapter. The next day, the next day, he's giving not only a logical, but a chronological sequence in his gospel. And he calls attention to places and cities, Bethabara, beyond Jordan, Cana of Galilee. He'll call attention to these places. And the great theme, of course, is the deity of Christ. I think one of the keys to this gospel is 1628, where the Lord Jesus said, I've come forth from the Father, and I'm come into the world. Again, I leave the world, and I go to the Father. And when he came into this world, John immediately ties him down to these geographical places, you see. That is something that's important to note. And although the deity of Christ is emphasized in this gospel, it's in the forefront. But the humanity of Christ is not lost sight of. Do you notice it's only John that tells about his trip through Samaria, and he sat down at the well, why being wearied with his journey. Can you think of anything more human than that? Well, I can think of one thing. Jesus wept. And who gives us that? Well, John gives us that. And the name Jesus is used almost entirely to the exclusion of Christ in this gospel. And that's strange because the emphasis is upon the deity of Christ, and you'd think that he would use the name Christ. But he doesn't. He used the name Jesus. Why? Because God became a man. The word Jew occurs over 60 times in this gospel. Now, let me give you the statement of certain men who have had something to say about this gospel. Origen said, "...the gospel is the consummation of the gospels as the gospels are of the Scriptures." Someone else has called it the heart of Christ, or the spiritual gospel, and in Europe it's called the bosom of Christ. And Jerome said, "...John excels in the depths of divine mysteries." And Kulros said, I believe the writings of John have been blotted by more penitence, tears, and have won more hearts for the Redeemer than all the rest put together. And Dr. Pearson wrote, It touches the heart of Christ. If Matthew corresponds to the court of Israel, Mark to the court of the priests, and Luke to the court of the Gentiles, then John leads us past the veil into the Holy of Holies. And D.A. Hayes says, As we read, we are assured that here at last is the worthy and adequate picture of the life of Jesus among men. Now, the deity of Jesus is the paramount purpose of this gospel. The messianic character also holds priority. And it's stated in John 20, 31. And I guess this would have to be considered the very key of the gospel. Many other signs truly did Jesus, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, 
the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And I like to also, as I've already mentioned, John 16, 28, how wonderfully that describes the gospel. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and I go to the Father. God became a man. This is the simple statement of the sublime fact, or as John Wesley expressed it, God contracted to a span. Now, the things that are written in this gospel are written to beget faith in the heart of man. Believe is used over 100 times in John's gospel, and it occurs less than 40 times in the other three gospels put together. The noun faith does not occur in John, but it's used in the other gospels. Eternal life occurs 35 times but only twelve times in the other three Gospels. So what we have here is the active verb believe, and it's generally used with believe in, believe upon, or believe into. It's an act of the will. It's not something that is static. It doesn't mean to nod your head and give an intellectual assent to the facts of the gospel. It means that when you hear the facts of the gospel, you recognize that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that means that you trust him as the Savior who died to pay the penalty for your sins. That's so important, by the way, to see. Now, we have divided this gospel in a way that we believe is a very simple way. We have the prologue. That's in the first 18 verses of the first chapter. Then we have the introduction in the rest of the first chapter. And then beginning at chapter 2 through chapter 12, we have the witness of works and words. And then we have the witness of Jesus to his witnesses, or the Upper Room Discourse, 13 through 17. And the rest of it is the witness of Jesus to the world. In other words, witness of Jesus to all, to the world. And that's 18 through 20. Then you have an epilogue, and you have the glorified Christ in chapter 21. I think that pretty much gives us the division. Now I think we're ready to begin the prologue. And friends, we'll get our foot in the door, but this is without doubt one of the most profound sections that you'll find. And none of us will be able adequately to understand it. We can only stand on the fringe of these great truths. And under this section, we're going to call attention to some things that necessarily had to be omitted in the rather full outline that I've just gone over. But they characterize this gospel and they add to a better understanding of the contents. Now, in chapter 1, Jesus is called the Word, the Logos. And that isn't explained by Greek philosophy, but by the Hebrew tetragram Jehovah, that he is Jehovah. Now, we have this statement here. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Four great earth-shaking statements are made. Now, the first one is, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the beginning here, there are actually three beginnings that are mentioned in Scripture. The beginning in Genesis goes back to the creation of the physical universe. And you can't date that. It's been characteristic to laugh at Usher's dating that the creation of the world took place about five or 6,000 years ago. Well, you can poo-poo that, all right. That's not true. But you can poo-poo the latest things that the scientists are saying, that it's two billion years old. Now, because you find a bone down in Africa and you try to date it, 
and you say that it goes back two billion years. May I say to you, you don't know that at all. That doesn't mean the universe has been here that long. doesn't prove it at all. What it does prove is that it's probably been here at least two billion years, but I think they're pikers. I think they're just as wrong as Usher was to say five or six thousand years and to say two or three billion years. Why, this earth has been here maybe two or three trillion years. And friends, it could have been here two or three squillion years. It's been here a long time. After all, we have a God of eternity. What do you think he's been doing in the past? Waiting for you and me to arrive here? May I say to you, he hasn't been waiting around for us. I'm of the opinion that a great drama has gone on in eternity past that you and I know nothing about at all. And so this universe has been here a long, long time. In the beginning was the Word. But the interesting thing is here, the beginning that's mentioned here, when it's mentioned, it's already past tense. Continued action is the imperfect that's used here. In the beginning was the Word. So you go back like they're going today, two billion years, three billion years, put on your stakes. All right, when you do, the Lord Jesus comes out of eternity to meet you, and he's already past tense. In the beginning was the Word. So here's a beginning that's no beginning at all. It's the beginning that you and I can go to, and we can't even go to it. We can't even conceive of it. But wherever you want to put down your pegs, the Lord Jesus is already past tense. He's the Ancient of Days, and his hair is as white as snow, even back yonder billions of years ago, my beloved. In the beginning was the Word. Now, to determine the exact meaning, I don't think it's easy. Obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ is not the logist of Greek philosophy. Rather, he's the memra of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Word of God. And notice how important the Word is in the Old Testament. For instance, the name for Jehovah was never pronounced. It was such a holy word that they never used it at all. But this is the one who is the Word, and gathering up everything that was said of him in the Old Testament, he is now presented as the one in the beginning. Now, as we said before, this beginning annotates the very first words in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That beginning can be dated, although I do not believe that anyone can date it accurately. You and I are dealing with the God of eternity, and when you go back to creation, he's already there. And that's exactly the way this is used. In the beginning was the Word. Notice it is not is the Word. It was in the beginning that the Word started out or was begotten. Was is known as a durative imperfect. I'm being technical now for a minute. And the meaning is that it's continued action. It means that the Word was in the beginning. What beginning? Well, just as far back as you want to go. The Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Does that begin God? No. Just keep on going back billions and trillions and squillions of years. I can think back to billions of years back of creation. Maybe you can go beyond that, but let's put on a point there. Billions of years back of creation. He already was. He comes out of eternity to meet us. He did not begin. In the beginning was the Word. He was already there when the beginning was. Well, somebody says there has to be a beginning somewhere. All right. Wherever you begin, he's there to meet you. He's already past tense. In the beginning was the Word. Five words in the original language. And there's not a man on top side of this earth who can put a date on it or understand it or fathom it. This first tremendous statement starts us off in space, you see. Now, the second statement is this. And the Word was with God. This makes it abundantly clear that he's separate and distinct from God the Father. 
You cannot identify him as God the Father because he's with God. But someone says, if he's with God, he's not God. Well, the third statement sets us straight. The word was God. This is a clear, emphatic declaration that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. In fact, the Greek is more specific than this, because in the Greek language, the important word is placed at the beginning of the sentence, and it reads, God was the Word. And friends, that's emphatic. You cannot get it more emphatic than that. Do you want to get rid of the deity of Christ? My friend, you cannot get rid of it. The first three statements in John's gospel tie the thing down. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, will you notice, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And he's the creator also. All things were made by him. Jesus is the creator. Now, he keeps on. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Now, in him was life. That doesn't mean he was alive. Of course, that was true. But there was life. You see, men need life because they're all dead in trespasses and sins. You remember Paul said to the Ephesians, that's the way that he began that second chapter. He said, "...ye were dead in trespasses and sins, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins." You see, what men need today is life, and in him was life, and the life was the light of man, and Jesus is light. And you'll notice now he's contrasted to John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John the Baptist bore witness to the light. He was not the light. He just bore witness to the light. And we're told the same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now, will you notice what it says here? That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now we have here a tremendous statement. You see, light comes through the Word of God. Without the Word of God, there's no light. And when men come to the Word of God, they're in the light. If we walk in the light, as he's in the light. What light? The light of the Word of God. And this light lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That is, any man that comes to the light. It's just like the sun. It lights every man that comes into the sunlight. But those that are way down in the caves of the earth, it doesn't light them. You have to come to the light. Now, it says he was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. That is the tragedy of the world. It's still the tragedy of the world that the Creator came down to this earth and took upon Himself our humanity, and yet the world didn't know Him, and the world rejects Him. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Some like to limit that to the nation. He came to His own people. It can be widened out. He came unto His own world because he's been talking about he made the world. He came to his own world, and his own world received him not. It's a universal rejection of him. But notice, "...but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name." Now, life is received, therefore, by the new birth. Notice what he says, "...but as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the sons of God, even that believe on his name." And it comes through faith, and it says, "...which were born." It's the life that's received by the new birth, 
And that comes by faith, by receiving Christ, which were born not of blood. Now, that means natural generation. Then it's not by the will of the flesh. That means that you don't become a child of God by your own self-effort, by something you do, your good works, nor of the will of man. That's education and training. You don't become a child of God by training. You become a child of God by being born again, because it says, "...nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God." It's the direct action of the Spirit of God. As the Lord Jesus will say in the third chapter, "...born of the Spirit." You must be born of the Spirit. Now we come here to three more statements. We had actually four statements back in the first three verses. But here now in verse 14, we have three more statements. And the Word was made flesh, and the Word dwelt among us. And we beheld, third, we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the Word was made flesh. I want you to look at that for just a moment. The Greek philosopher probably would have stayed with us through verse 1, but he'd leave us here because he'd never agree that the Word was made flesh. The Greek language also allows us to put it more specifically, and I think more accurately, the Word was born flesh. And now turn this over in your mind for a moment. Here comes God out of eternity. He's already the Ancient of Days, but he also came to Bethlehem. George MacDonough said it. They were looking for a king to lift them high. He came a little baby thing that made a woman cry. And notice that John's gospel doesn't even mention his birth in Bethlehem. You know why? He's talking about one who's too big for Bethlehem. He comes out of eternity. And he takes upon himself our humanity. The Word became flesh, or was born flesh. Now, here's the Christmas story that's in John's gospel. And it's very important to see that, that he was born flesh. And the only way it could take place was by the virgin birth, you see. The writer to the Hebrews says, in Hebrews 2:16, "For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, and he took part of flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil." Now there's some that think that these statements that are made here, which were born, that it not only refers to the new birth of the believer, but it speaks of his birth. He was born not of blood. That is, he was not born in a human way, that is, by human effort, nor the will of the flesh, by human effort, the will of man. But he was born of God, and the Word was made flesh. What a statement here. The Word was made flesh. Here is the Christmas story. He was born flesh unto us. A child is born unto us. A son is given. A little child was born in Bethlehem, but the son came out of eternity. The Word was born flesh. Now, the second statement is, the Word dwelt among us. And the word dwelt here is skeneo, and it means to just pitch a tent. Skenaz means a tent. Our human bodies here are just little tents in which we live, and they're just as frail as a tent, friends. The apostle Paul used the same imagery. He says, we know that if this tabernacle be dissolved, that is, this house in which we live is a tabernacle. It's a little tent, and it can be blown over in a night. A little wind can blow it over. It can be snuffed out in an instant. And because you and I live in these little tents, the God of eternity 
came down to this earth, and he took upon himself a human body and pitched his tent here among us. And that's a second tremendous statement. And notice the third. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now he's saying something else. The question I'd naturally ask at this point is, if he was made flesh, he certainly limited himself. John says, wait a minute. He was full of grace and truth. The word full means that you just could not have any more. He brought all the deity with him. He was full of grace and full of truth when he came down here. How tremendous this is. And now we have here John bear witness of him. And John cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. It's out of the fullness of Christ, for the pleroma of Christ. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth. This is the one we're talking about. Now we come to a third great statement that's made here. No man hath seen God at any time. That is one that runs all the way through the Scripture. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now, we have here the first, no man hath seen God at any time. Why? Well, he's going to explain it in this gospel. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ will tell a woman at the well that God's a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. For God is spirit. No man has seen God at any time. What about the appearances in the Old Testament? God never revealed himself in the Old Testament to the eyes of man. What then did they see? Well, go back and read the record. For instance, Jacob said that he saw God. But what he saw was the angel of the Lord who wrestled with him. That was a manifestation, but he did not see God because God's a spirit. No man has seen God at any time. And I notice that second statement. The only begotten Son that's in the bosom of the Father. Believe me, friends, some translate this, even Nestle, the great German scholar, the only begotten God. Well, I like that. He's in the bosom of the Father. And that tells us a great deal. He didn't come from the head of God to reveal the wisdom of God, and he didn't come from the foot of God to be a servant of man. Have you ever noticed that he was a servant, but God's servant? He didn't shine shoes. He didn't run on errands. He didn't do what man would ask him to do. He says, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. He's God's servant. Came to serve him. Came from the bosom of the Father. He did not come from the feet. He did not come from the head. It was from the bosom of the Father that he came. He came to reveal the heart of God. He's the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. And the third statement completes verse 18. He hath declared him. And the Greek word here is exegeseto. Agos to lead and exes out means to exegete. It means that what Jesus Christ did was to lead God out in the open. Do you want to know anything bigger than that? A little trip to the moon's nothing in comparison. Here he comes out of eternity past, the God of this universe, the creator of everything, taking upon himself human flesh and bringing God out into the open so that men can know him. My friend, the only way in the world you can know God is through this one, Jesus Christ. He came to reveal God because he is God. And I'm not through with these statements. There's something else here. I haven't time to go into all of it. But notice the statements in verses 1 and 2 and then verse 14, verse 18. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was made flesh. No man hath seen God at any time. You could not see God. God's a spirit. He had to become flesh. He had to become one of us in order for us to know him. 
we would not go up there to understand him. He had to come down here and bring God down where we are. Now, let's put the second statements in these three together. The Word was with God, verse 1, and dwelt among us, verse 14. Verse 18, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. But consider this one for a moment. The angels bowed before him. He was with God, on an equality with God. The apostle Paul wrote to him, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That is, he did not go to school to become God. It was something that he didn't have to work overtime to attain. It was not a degree that he earned. He did not try to be God. He was God. I do not mean to be irreverent, but he did not say to the Father when he came to this earth, keep your eye on Gabriel. I think he's after my job. Watch him while I'm gone. He didn't have to do that. Nobody could take his place. He was God. And here he comes, born in Bethlehem. A few little shepherds there, not many. He goes up to Nazareth, 30 years hidden away in Nazareth, in that little miserable town. God out of eternity coming down and going to Nazareth, working in a carpenter shop. Why? Well, so you can know God, friend. The only way you will ever know him, my friend, is to know this one, the only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father. He's the only one who can reveal God to us. Now, notice the third statement in each group. The Word was God, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the third, he hath declared him. When he was down here, he was still God, full of grace and truth, and he declared him. He's the only one who can lead him out in the open where we can get acquainted with him, and we're not through with this. I want you to see something else. How do you divide up this universe? I sat with a man who designed the shield that's been on all these spacecrafts to make their reentry. He's a scientist who's an authority on heat. As we had lunch together in New Jersey, he said, You know, this universe is made up of just three things. I believe that God has put his fingerprints on everything. The Trinity is everywhere. Then he explained what he meant. He says this universe is divided up into time, space, and matter. Can you think of a fourth friend? The very interesting thing is that time, space, and matter include everything that's in this universe as you and I know it. Then time can be divided into just three parts, past, present, and future. Can you think of a fourth? And what about space, length, breadth, and height? Is there another direction? Also, there is in matter, energy, motion, and phenomena. Those are the three divisions of the three divisions. The universe in which we live bears the mark of the Trinity. Now, we've spent some time, friends, here in the introduction and this prologue to the Gospel of John. The reason is that we consider it very important, in fact, all important. And we have three remarkable statements in verses 1 and 2, and then in verse 14, and then verse 18. And there are three statements in each one of them, and we've attempted to put those three statements together. And we saw that they correspond to, well, what's this universe that you and I live in today? How would you divide the universe? Well, I told you about the scientist up in New Jersey that told me, he says, this universe can be divided into time, space, and matter. Could you think of a fourth something that ought to go into this universe? And we attempted to divide these three like that. You have here time, space, and matter in all of them. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Reaches back yonder into eternity past. Time, space. Verse 14, the Word was made flesh, came down. And Paul describes that, how he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and he came all the way down to this earth. I tell you, he compassed space, and a little trip to the moon isn't even to be compared to the fact he came from heaven's glory and came all the way down to the death of the shameful cross 
And then matter, and that's verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he's declared him. And if I may put it bluntly, he became matter, became a man, took upon himself our humanity. And this is the way you and I can know about God. Now you can in turn divide time, space, and matter, each one of them into three. For instance, time is past, present, and future. And can you add something to that? In the beginning was the Word. That's past. Present, the Word became flesh. That is, in our day, He came down and became a man. And future, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, He hath declared Him. And even the apostle Paul had to say at the end of his life, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. That looks into the future. Someday we're going to be in his presence and we're going to come to know him, how wonderful he is. And then will you look at space? And we have length and breadth and height. In the beginning was the Word. And that reaches way back. Bread. He came down to this earth and was made flesh. And then the height... No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son that's in the bosom of the Father. He came from the heights to set him before us. That's space, if you please. And then we have matter, and matter's divided into three, energy, motion, and phenomena. Now, energy, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. What energy? He spoke in this universe came into existence. And what a tremendous thing that is. And then motion. The Word was made flesh. He came out of heaven's glory, and He came to this earth. And then the phenomena, greatest phenomenon in this world is Jesus Christ. The wonders of the ancient world. The wonders to see in our day. And all the findings of science are nothing in comparison to the wonder of the incarnation, God became a man, and he came down to this earth to reveal God and to redeem man. And friends, you can't get anything bigger than this. How tremendous this is. This prologue is awe-inspiring. And though it's simple language, you and I'll never be able to plumb the depths in this life. Now let me move on into our study that we set before us for today. And we read here in verse 19, And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Now, this is the first incident in the life of John, which John here in his gospel gives us a record. We have no beginning here of this man, the birth of him, like you have over in Luke. And this is the record of John. And what was it? Well, they came and asked him, Who art thou? And there's a subtle temptation in that. Here was an opportunity to make something of himself. But this man very frankly confessed, and he said, He must increase, but I must decrease. What a statement that is. And that's a statement that not only should a believer make, but he ought to live that statement. He must increase, but I must decrease. And friends, both can't be on top. Either Christ is primary in your life, occupies first place, or you, that is, the selfish I, will be on top. You can't have both. He must increase, and I must decrease, or else it'll be the other way around. He was asked the question by the people, Who are thou? And he confessed and denied not, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. You see, they cleverly suggested that he might be the Messiah, and they had a messianic hope. And he made it very clear, I'm not the Christ, I'm not the Messiah. You are looking to the wrong man. Well, then, if he's not Christ, then he must be some other great person. And they ask him, What then art thou Elias? That is, Elijah. And he said, I am not. 
And then they said, Art thou that prophet? That is a prophet like unto Moses, which way back in Deuteronomy God promised he had sent. And he answered, No. And you notice how matter-of-fact John is here. His answers are very terse and very brief. And they get briefer as they continue to question him. Who art thou? He says, I'm not the Christ. And they said, then you must be Elijah. He said, I am not. And then they said, well, you must be that prophet that was predicted. He gives an emphatic no. Now notice what they did. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? They said, You must tell us who you are. We can't take back a bunch of negatives and say, he's not this, and he's not this one, or that one, or the third one. And so he identifies himself here. Listen to John. And he said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. He's a voice. You see, Christ was the Word. John was the voice. Over the radio today, and as you listen to me right now, I'm reduced to a voice. I've been going around holding radio rallies, and I've enjoyed meeting so many of our listeners. And many of these people say, well, I have a face now to go with the voice. Or I've often wondered how you look. And I sometimes say to these folk, especially when some dear sweet lady comes up to me and says, I've been listening to you, and I wonder what you look like. And I say, well, you thought I was a little, short, ugly old man. And they say, oh, my, no. Of course, they try to get away from that one. And I say, well, you found out you were right after all. Well, may I say that I'm just a voice here. Now, that's all John wanted to be. And you can be sure of one thing that we are more than a voice, and we want to be more than a voice. But John was willing to be no more than just a voice. That was all. And he had a grand message to give, a message greater than he is. And frankly, I'm satisfied just to be a voice because certainly the message we've got is greater than the individual. And I think one of the beauties about radio is that a personality doesn't get involved hear that it's just the voice that you hear, and that voice should, of course, declare the glories of Christ. Now, he had a grand message to give here, and will you listen to him as he said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. In other words, it's a grand message, get ready for the coming of the Lord. And I take it that that's what he meant. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was at hand in the person of the king, you see. And he says, make straight. In other words, get the crooked things out of your life. And friends, we're not going to have fellowship with him and not get very far with him until we are willing to deal with the crooked things that are in our lives, the things that are wrong. And when we do that, then there is open for us fellowship. We say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie. As someone has said, as Captain Jack, I think, years ago, I will dig a ditch so straight and true that even God can look it through. Well, that's the thing we need to get straight in our lives, and we can get that straight by confession, of course. Now, will you notice here, he's quoting Isaiah, of course. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And that's in Isaiah 43. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elijah, neither that prophet? They ask him now a technical point. If you're none of these, why do you baptize? Well, now listen to John's answer. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet 
I'm not worthy to unloose. Now, we call him today John the Baptist, but he denied that he was the Baptist. He said, I only use water. said, there's coming one after me, and he's going to baptize with fire and Holy Spirit. And that fire is a baptism of judgment that's yet to come upon the earth, by the way. And the Holy Spirit baptism took place at Pentecost. Now, I wonder if Christ was in the crowd there that day. I don't know. He could have been. Now, will you notice? He that comes after me, he says, is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I'm not worthy to unloose. Now, a servant must do every task of his master, but a disciple must do every task except take the thong out of the teacher's shoes. That was the rule of that day. Now, John says, I'm a servant. I'm not even a disciple. I'm just a servant. I'm not even worthy to be that servant. But that's what he was. Now, in verse 28, these things were done in Beth Abara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now, I called attention at the beginning that John gears us in to the geography and to the calendar. And here we have a geographical location given to us. Now, will you notice we have the time. The next day, John constantly gears the one who came out of eternity, and the Word was made flesh, and he was geared into our calendar down here and to our clock, so that the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, John marks him out here. He is the Savior. He is not only the Messiah. He is the Savior. He's the Lamb. And he is a very great Savior. He's the Lamb of God. He's a complete Savior. And he takes away the sin of the world. He's an almighty Savior. And he taketh, present tense, he's a perpetual Savior, so that anyone can come to him any time. And here is the answer that Abraham gave to his son Isaac. Isaac said, here's the altar and the wood, but where's the lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide himself a lamb. Here is the lamb. And this now proves that Cain was wrong. Abel was right. Abel brought a little lamb, and all the lambs that were slain on Jewish altars down through the ages now find their fulfillment in him. And John marks him out and says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And he says, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. In other words, John says he's the real baptizer, Jesus the Baptist, if you please. He's the baptizer. He's the one that will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Fire is the judgment that's yet to come on this earth. Now, I want to just continue to read. John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove at a boat upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Spirit. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now, the next day, verse 35, again the next day after John stood two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Before, it was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's the work of Christ, the Lamb of God now, the person of Christ. He is the Lamb in his person. And we find here that John now baptizing him, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And these two disciples now follow. 
And Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where do you dwell? And he said unto them, Come and see. That's his invitation to you today. Come and see. Taste of the Lord and see whether he's good or not. They came and saw where he dwelt, abode with him that day. It was about the tenth hour. Notice how we geared into time. It was late in the evening. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, Andrew had been a follower of John the Baptist. What does he do first? He goes after his own brother Simon, saith unto him, We found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Now, this man had been as weak as water. Our Lord says you'll be the stone man. And I think everybody laughed there that day because nobody believed he could become the rock man, the man who'd stand up on the day of Pentecost and give the first sermon in the church. Verse 43, The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now, Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. That's up on the Sea of Galilee. Again, we're dealing with geography, you see. And we know that Andrew and Peter, all of them lived up there. They were fishers. And Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We found him who Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael, he's a wise acre. He makes a wise crack here. And Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, Philip said. That's who he is. And Nathanael said unto him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And I think he laughed at his own joke, by the way. But Philip didn't. Philip saith unto him, Come and see. And that's the thing. Come to Christ. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith unto him, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no guile. Here's an Israelite in whom there's no Jacob. You see... This man was a wise cracker, but he didn't mean anything by it. A great many people kid, and they don't mean a thing in the world by it at all. I always like the man with the sense of humor. I'm afraid of the man who doesn't have the sense of humor. I like Nathaniel, you know. And Nathaniel's overcome by him. An Israelite in whom there's no Jacob. He's not being clever. Nathaniel said unto him, Whence knowest thou? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. The Lord Jesus had two doubters that were his apostles. One at the beginning, that's Nathanael. One at the end, that's Thomas. This man now, a doubter, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He confesses immediately. He's the Son of God, the Son of God, King of Israel. That's still a question for many folk. How can any good come out of Nazareth? He spent 30 years there. Well, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Or thou shalt see greater things than these. Now, this man in the three years saw much greater things than these. But this is the answer that he gave him. He saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, our Lord had said to this man, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no Jacob. Now, our Lord follows up on this and refers to this incident in the life of old Jacob when, as a young man, he had run away from home. In fact, he had to leave home. His brother Esau was after him to murder him. And so his first night away from home was at Bethel, and there the Lord appeared to him, and a ladder was let down from heaven. And on that ladder, angels were ascending and descending. Well, the meaning for Jacob was that God had not lost contact with him. 
In fact, God would be with him, although he left home. And when he left home, he thought he left God there. He had a limited view of God, of course. And now he finds out that God is going to be with him. Now, our Lord picks that up here and says that that ladder was himself. You'll see now the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The angels ministered to him. And the angels were subject to him. So he was given charge over the angels so he could send them as messengers to heaven and they would return. You'll see heaven open, the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And upon this one, he is to see that the Father from the top of that ladder will speak down and say, "'This is my beloved Son,' in whom I am well pleased. This ladder is Christ. And this is the only way that you and I can make contact with God. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And he is the ladder. It's not one you climb, but one you trust, one you rest upon, one you believe in. That's the important thing here. 